Shalom. Today we're going to do a special teaching on the four coverings of the tabernacle. I'm going to be referring to some other teachings, uh, particularly one about the tabernacle, one which is all the colors of the rainbow, and the third one is the basic pardes teaching. And I'll put the links for those below so you can check those out. So this is a schematic of what the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness, looked like. We have an open space, which was clear for everybody to see, with the altar of burnt offering and the laver was there. A lot of activity going on there. And then there is the ohel, the tent, which is covered over by these four coverings. The tent part is made of two sections, the holy place, which is in the front, and the back, which is the holy of holies. And it shows you in the holy place, it's the lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And in the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant is. In the tabernacle teaching, I taught about how the three parts of the tabernacle are parallel to the parts of the human being, the spirit, soul, and the body. The holy place is represents the soul, and the Holy of Holies represents the spirit man. And so it's interesting that these four coverings cover those two places together because those are the two parts that need to be together. The soul needs to learn how to be subjected to the spirit. The articles and the two places are parallel to one another. All that's in the tabernacle teaching. So it's a nice picture there covered together. So here's a picture of the four coverings over the tent and this is the picture that comes with if you buy a little kit to make yourself a miniature tabernacle so you can learn about it and it's a great learning tool but in this picture the four coverings are offset from each other but that's not how they were they all would have been one on top of the other totally covering each other so we're going to start with the outermost covering which is talked about in Exodus 26, 14. First, it talks about the second covering, and thou shalt make a covering of ram skins dyed red. We'll discuss that next, but first we're going to discuss a covering above of badger skins. So the outside covering, the very outside that will be visible, is these badger skins. So before you get too excited about the fact that there are probably not any badgers, or any other animals mentioned as definitions for this word in the middle of the wilderness, and where did they get that stuff? We know that when the children of Israel left Egypt, as it says in Exodus 3.22, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor, and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil, that means plunder, the Egyptians. So later, when they were building the tabernacle, Moses called for donations. Exodus 25, 2-8 Speak unto the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood oil for the light spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense onyx stones and and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate and let them make me a sanctuary that i might dwell among them and so the people voluntarily brought all these materials Presumably, they had brought them with them out of Egypt. The Egyptians willingly gave their stuff up to the Israelites just so that the Israelites would leave because they realized they were under so much pressure and condemnation because they would not let the Israelites go. Now concerning the badger or dugong or durable leather or porpoise or seal, there's a lot of translations. The word for this in Hebrew is tachash. It's only used in one other place, and clearly it's some kind of leather that you could make shoes out of. Ezekiel 16.10 I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger's skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. Now when we look in the Septuagint translation, there's no mention of badgers. 
um, we see this word, which I've highlighted for you in blue, yakinthia, yakinthia, which is a cognate word for the color, which is used later consistently, jacinth, which is a blue color, or we know the flower hyacinth comes from the same word, and so it's kind of some kind of bluish color. When they translated the Torah into Greek, that translation is called the Septuagint. It was done around 285 BCE. The English translation of that document translates this word blue. And so it says that there were blue skins as covering above. There's nothing about any animal. In the first century, in the Aramaic Targums, it uses the word purple or there's one multicolored. When we get to 400 CE, we have the Vulgate translation into Latin, and it uses the cognate for jacinth for this blue color. Wycliffe translated the Bible into English in 1384, and he also used jacinth. Tyndale, in 1522, tried to make a transliteration, and he wrote taxis skins like tachash. So that really didn't have a meaning. He was just transliterating what the Hebrew said. However, in 1534, 1524, Luther substituted an animal name in there, Dachsfellen, which is the German word for badger. They picked that up in the Geneva Bible, 1599, and so it's been used rather extensively since. Some people have gone to porpoise, so, and we're going to look at all these animals in a minute. Uh, some people say, well, it's probably an extinct animal, and we don't know what it is. So let's look at the different animals. There are several different kinds of badgers in the world, and you see all the yellow place. Those are honey badgers, and they are in Africa and in the Saudi Peninsula. But if you look at the inset, there aren't any in Egypt or Sinai. That makes it look not very like. Here's a picture of the fellow. He's about 30 inches long and 11 inches wide, which means that they would need a lot of them to make this covering. And then you have the weird appendages of the tail and legs hanging out. Might have been a little awkward. Their skin is very loose, which is nice for removing it and using the skin. However, they're very fierce and ferocious, so that's not so nice for trying to catch them. If you've never seen any videos, it's worth it to get on YouTube and just look at some of the serious behavior of badgers. Now, this is a dugong, and this is their distribution in the world. And you can see they run right up the Red Sea, all the way even almost to Cairo, and I don't know how they get in the Nile, but presumably they're there. They're 10 feet long. Uh, so that would be a nice size piece of fabric to work with if you were trying to make a covering. They're not exactly blue, but maybe on a good day if the sun hit the water and hit the animal in a certain way, you might think they were bluish. This is a distribution of porpoises, which there aren't any in the Middle East at all, so we can rule those out. So I would say either we're talking about dugongs, which are relative to manatees, if you're familiar with those, or we're talking about some extinct animal. So that's the outside most covering and it's meant to protect the whole tent, the whole ohel from the elements outside. So the second covering going in is the ram skins dyed red as we saw in Exodus 26 14. And of course when we think about the ram we think about Genesis 23:13. and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a ram caught in the thicket by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. When we think about skin being dyed red we are reminded of Joseph's coat Genesis 37:31. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. Now we're going to see that there's a relationship between this dying process and baptism. In Matthew 3.11, it is written, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Greeks used the word baptizo to describe the dying of a garment, in which the whole material was plunged in and taken out from the element used. So there's a matter of soaking in the dye, and the, the garment, the fabric, takes on a new character, a new color from this soaking. 
This word should not be confused with bapto, which is a different word. They're related. The clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, who lived about 200 BCE. It is a recipe for making pickles and is helpful because it uses both words. Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable should first be dipped, bapto, into boiling water and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of vegetables in a solution, but the first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing the vegetable, produces a permanent change. So we have these ram skins dyed red. They've been soaked in this solution, and their character changes. Now I've talked about the little bug, the cochineal, uh, several places. You can see more about that in the Colors of the Rainbow teaching. But it's such a lovely story that I'm going to tell it again. When the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave again. The eggs deposited beneath her body were thus protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter their own life cycle. As the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood. From the dead bodies of such female scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. What a picture this gives of Christ dying on the tree, shedding his precious blood that he might bring many sons to glory. He died for us that we might live through him. Psalm 22, 6 describes such a worm and gives us this picture of Christ. And this is from a book written by Henry Morris, the biblical basis for modern science. So this is where the dye, the red dye for the ram skins comes from, is from this bug. The third curtain, the third covering coming down is the goat's hair, Exodus 26, 7. And thou shalt make curtains of goat's hair to be a covering upon the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. Now, goats have some negative connotations, but in fact, we see in Exodus 12, 5, that they are acceptable even for a Passover offering back in that day. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Genesis 27, 9 and verse 16. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth, so they're kosher to eat. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. So they have a skin that can be like a human being on the outside. Of course, this is what Rachel did for Jacob so that he would appear to be Esau. Finally, we have the mo in most of the coverings. Exodus 26, 1. Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet. With cherubims of cunning work shalt thou make them. There is an interesting word relationship here, which we'll see a little more in a moment. In Exodus 26, 36. And thou shalt make a hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen wrought with needlework. So this is the word for embroider, and it's talking about the same fabric which hangs in the front of the door and also the curtain over the whole thing. So where else we see this word is in Psalm 139, 15. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought, I was embroidered in the lowest parts of the earth. So there is a way that the human being is embroidered. He's made, embroidered by Yehovah. So in a brief review, this is the pardes. The pe stands for peshat, which is the plain meaning of the word. The resh, the r, stands for the remez. We have reference or an inference. The dal stands for drash. It's the searching out meaning. It's the devotional meaning for us. And the samech, the sud, is the secret meaning for the latter days. Now everything in the Old Testament, Paul tells us, is for examples for us. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, examples, and they 
are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Can you believe it? Paul thought it was the end of the world. So here's just another picture. Put it back in your mind. We have the outside is the badger skins. Underneath that, the ram skins dyed red. Underneath that, we have the goat's hair curtain. And all the way on the inside is this beautiful woven embroidered fabric, white linen threads with these three other colors in them. So for the outermost, we're going to be looking at the plain meaning which we apply to the forefathers. The outermost covering was for protection. And we see that that is one of the initial relationships. It's one of the initial signs that Jehovah gives to the ancients. Genesis 3.21 Unto Adam also and to his wife did Jehovah make coats of skins and clothe them. Genesis 15.1 after these things, the word of Jehovah came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. In Exodus 13, 21, And Jehovah went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. So it's not to say that he has not provided us with those things, or that he didn't provide the forefathers with anything else, but this is a very basic foundational concept. Psalm 62, 2. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Psalm 121, 5. Yehovah is your keeper. Yehovah is a shade upon your right hand. He's a covering. The second layer we're going to look at as a reference to Messiah. John 1 29. The next day John seeth Yeshua coming to him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. 1 Corinthians 5 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Messiah, our Passover, that is a Passover lamb, he is the Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. When we're talking about the difference between the lamb and the ram, we see what happened back in Genesis 22, 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. But what happened in verse 13, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So in early times, we didn't see the lamb right away. We see the ram. Why are the skins dyed red? Well, clearly, it has to do with the blood of Yeshua. 1 John 1, seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Also, we see this end times prophecy in Isaiah 63, 1 through 3. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Botsra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in mine fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain my raiment. Very clearly, the ram skins dyed red, especially when we understand where the dye came from, the bug that leaves its red stain on the tree, all pointing to Yeshua. The devotional meaning is for us as we seek out an application to our own lives. We're talking about the goat hair. Genesis 25, 25. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Uh, if you look at the colors, teaching the colors of the rainbow and you look at the red there are two reds there esau it says is edom edom is a word that is related to adom the word for red and he came out red esau 
is a prototypical picture of the flesh man, the man who is only interested in the lentil soup, in the out hunting. He is only interested in material things. He despises his birthright, the spiritual thing. Now, when you are born, you are in that material state, as Paul teaches, 1 Corinthians 15, 46. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. The natural comes first, and afterward that which is spiritual. And in fact, we see that the sheep and goats live together until the very last day when the judgment comes and they are separated. Matthew 25, 32, and 33. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall put the sheep on his right hand, the good side, but the goats are going on the left, which is the bad side. So we live in a fleshly body. We're part goat until the end judgment. Then we're separated from our fleshly lives. By the way, that word there that is hairy in the previous verse, we're talking about Esau, that word hairy is seir, and it's another name for a male goat. Finally, we come to the last covering. This is the secret, the sod, which is for the latter days, for the end times. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That covering is made of white linen, which represents the saints, and then the three other colors. There's the blue, the purple, and the red. They are always, always given in that color. The blue is the color of the special band in the tzitzit, in the fringes. It's also the color of the fabric which covers the Ark of the Covenant when the people travel. The, that color blue represents the Lord God, the Father. The purple is the color of the King. Matthew 2.2, 2, saying, Where is he that is born the King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. Revelation 19.16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. John 19.2, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. The purple represents the kingship. They're blue for God, purple for the king, and finally red. We already talked about red. Red is the color of man. The word for blood is in the word for man. You can find all that in the Colors of the Rainbow teaching. So those three things together, we see him as he is. God and king and a human being. These things are woven together with the white which represents the saints. Colossians 1-2. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Messiah in you, the hope of glory. And so that fabric represents that end time truth the mystery revealed, Messiah in you, the hope of glory. One thing which I find interesting about that final fourth beautifully woven cover is that it is barely visible. It is underneath four other layers of covering. The only people who can see it are the priests who are going into the holy place to do their little jobs of lighting the lights or putting the bread or not that their jobs are, are unimportant, but the, the time that they spend in there doing that work is very minimal. They light the lights, they put up the bread, they keep the incense altar burning, or they have to get the fire from the incense altar to light the brazen altar outside. But it's pretty dark in there. Even all the light which might come from the menorah, the seven lamps, is supposed to be cast forward in front of it. And so there's not much light in the ceiling, and so it's dark, and you can't really see too much, and only very few people can see it. And that is so representative of us and how things will change. 
when he appears, we will see him as he is, and we will be like him. I really think that that cover represents that. It's a bit like the geode. So there is a word that is used in Hebrew, sigula, am sigula. It's translated as a special treasure. It has an implication of jewels. We are God's special jewel. But at the same time, the geode is totally closed up. So when you look at it from the outside, you just see a rock. It's not until you break it open and see what's on the inside that you can see the true beauty and why God would take us as his people because he sees what's going on inside us, the truth and the beauty and the jewels that he created for us to be. I pray that this has been edifying to you. Until next time, tasimit ha'inayim al hashamayim. Keep your eye on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.